Welcome to the Harvard Art Museums and tonight's lecture, The American Land Museum, Places as Cultural Artifacts. My name is Mitchell Johns, and I'm a senior living in Dunster House, and I concentrate in English with a secondary in computer science. And my name is Maya Swazo Maller. I'm also a senior living in Winthrop House, and I study the history of art and architecture and computer science. Mitch and I are both members of the Harvard Art Museum Student Board, and we're delighted to welcome you to the museum on this, this evening on behalf of our student community. Please now be sure to turn off your cell phones and help me warmly welcome Martha Tedeschi, the Elizabeth and John Moores Cabot Director of the Harvard Art Museums, who will introduce tonight's program. Thank you, Maya and Mitchell, for that great introduction. We're famous at the Harvard Art Museums for having introducers who introduce introducers and who then introduce the introducers before we get to the lecture. Um, but that's because we're also happy to be here and all of us want to have a chance to welcome you. So good evening, everyone. Um, as a longtime museum curator myself, and now as director of the Harvard Art Museums, I'm delighted to welcome you to this year's Curatorial Innovations Lecture. Launched in 2014, the Curatorial Innovations Lecture is an annual collaboration between the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture and the Harvard Art Museums. Each year, the program brings to campus internationally renowned curators who are breaking new ground in the organization of exhibits, displays, projects, and are transforming the museum field through innovative curatorial practice. Through a series of student workshops and public lectures, these speakers inspire students from diverse fields of knowledge and the broader public with new ideas about how museums and curators can bridge the sciences and the arts. The partnership foregrounds the essential role that original works of art, specimens, artifacts, and archives play in teaching across disciplines and seeks to provoke and challenge the way we think about curating these objects. We're thrilled tonight to welcome Matthew Coolidge to discuss his innovative work at the American Land Museum, which brings the museum to the object rather than the object into the museum. I want to warmly thank Jane Pickering, Peter Gallison, and the entire team of the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture for their continued partnership in this innovative program. The collaboration has already helped to catalyze broader conversations about curatorial practice on campus and will continue to move our shared work forward. Now, please join me in welcoming Peter Gallison, the Pellegrino University Professor of the History of Science and of Physics, to the podium to introduce our distinguished speaker, Peter. It's a great pleasure to welcome Matthew Coolidge here today to our uh, curatorial seminar that we've been hosting for these last several years because we think it's a moment, of all of us, at all of the various Harvard museums, when uh, curation can, be, uh, can occupy a much larger and important role within the cultural landscape and learning landscape of the university. Matthew's work is exemplary because it cuts across the lines of our various museums, which run across from museum of, uh, the Harvard Museum of Natural History, the Mineralogical Museum, the Anthropological Museum, the Peabody, the Art Museums, uh, and the Collection of Historical Scientific Instruments. Many of the students in history of science who, with whom I've had the privilege of working have been interested in the question of how land itself can be considered a technical object uh, as well as the host of aesthetic, historical, and social uh, engagement. And so it was really a particularly great pleasure that Matthew's been willing to join us. He is, in many ways, an exemplification of the intersection of military, historical, social, technical, and artistic engagement with the projects about which he's going to be speaking today at the, around Wendo, at the Wendover branch, uh, which was the Air Force base from which the planes practiced 
the attack on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also uh, a site in, contempor in the contemporary world, it's abutted by places of uh, radioactive dumping, of uh, sharpshooting, of drone practices, of mining, of, uh, and because of his work and the work of the center that he's directed also of artistic engagement in new ways of, of photography and filming and other sorts of installation projects. Uh, I've read once uh, in one of his interviews, uh, very interesting interviews, that Matthew likes to think of the photography work that goes on there as neither so beautiful that it represents a disengagement from the world and a pure engagement with art, nor so bad that its very <laughs> dysfunction calls attention to the medium and loses sight of the content in which it is um, engaged. So it's in looking at this multiplicity of, of ways of glossing the land itself, of being interested in place, its history, its current use, and all of the ways that it stands symbolically and actually in our society that Matthew Coolidge and his colleagues and visitors um, and artists have been able to really transform the way we look at land, landscape, art, and our current use of that land in a new way. It's with great pleasure that I want to welcome Matthew Coolidge. Uh, can you hear me okay? I'm gonna to switch to this microphone. Yep, great. Well, thank you, Peter, for that wonderful introduction and everybody else for uh, enabling me to come share with you some images and ideas about the American landscape. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, uh, when I appear at activities like this, how many people will really know about what we do. So for those who are familiar with it, uh, I just wanted to give a general overview of the organization in order to understand the context from which I'll explain and explore other things. This is our logo, uh, which was the first thing kind of did, uh, was to create this kind of corporate identity, the Center for Land Use. We are a nonprofit organization. I've uh, been around since 1994. Uh, what we do is look at the built landscape of the USA uh, as a kind of cultural artifact that we try and interpret and read in order to understand who we are, despite all the bigness and complications involved in such a, uh, a big task. Uh, we, we're interested in the physical landscape as an architectural or a, a uh, archeological specimen in a way of contemporary culture. Uh, we're interested in the interpretive realm that floats above the ground. The ground itself, of course, is just sort of inert material, though there isn't a single molecule at this point on the surface of the earth that hasn't been affected by human agency in some form. So all of it is uh, an artifact, really, everything on the surface. So we start with that as kind of a given. And, but still, by itself, of course, the ground means nothing. You have to elucidate meaning from it. And I'll just show this image, which I can't seem to not show, uh, to explain the phenomenology of place. So here you have the inert landscape, some desert, and then you have the interpretive plaque that interprets something that happened there. Uh, but it's not really that engaged with the site. It very clearly was sort of added to the site. And then you have the guy with a hat interpreting the interpretive plaque. Uh, and then the guy with a camera doing some kind of video documentary about the guy with a hat who's interpreting the interpretive plaque that interprets the site. And then you have the thing that's invisible that makes all of this visible, the photographer taking a picture of the guy with a video camera doing a video about the guy with a hat who's interpreting the interpretive plaque that interprets the site. And of course, it doesn't stop there. There's me telling you about the photographer who is, took the picture of the guy with the camera anyway. And then there's maybe you, maybe, telling somebody about me telling you about the photographer or anything. So this is, this is where we work, in that realm of interpretation that floats above the ground where meaning is actually constructed. So in a way, it has very little to do, on one hand, with the physical material of the earth, though it has everything to do with it as well. 
The other basic principle I just wanted to convey in understanding the fundamental structure of the organization is that we always look at the other side of things too. We try and, and acknowledge the fact that the act of looking is at the same time an act of obfuscation. When your attention is directed towards something, it's immediately drawn from everything else, away from everything else. So there's always another side, and in fact, much of it is the other side. So there's always more to every story and for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, as they say. Uh, and then this sort of fundamental paradox that you can have multiple points of view existing simultaneously about one thing. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, that's something we keep in mind all the time, too, is that there are many ways of looking at any given situation. It might even be this sort of quantum kind of uh, cognitional condition we're in now. So we collect information on places, uh, physical locations. We store information. We sort it. We classify it. Uh, the bedrock of our organization are selected locations that are uh, locked down with some kind of lat long. They actually exist in space there. And our filing cabinets are bursting with information about these places all sorted to uh, location uh, by state, but also these are our primary classification uh, categories. Uh, every kind of land use fits into one of these. We squeeze it in there. And it's really about information management more than reality. Obviously, you can have one thing be many things, and most things are many things, but still, in order to retrieve something, you have to know where it's stored. It has to exist in some compartment. Otherwise, it's all just a gray blob. And anybody who works in library sciences and stuff knows this very, very well. We all deal with this kind of uh, classification system and how things are, are made to be concrete, even though they aren't in order to be retrievable. But this also gives you a sense of how the center begins to look at the world uh, in terms of its different uh, uh, organizational approaches. And uh, we take the information that we collect, uh, and the imagery is all done by people working for the organization, so we don't store historic photos. We occasionally use them in exhibits and things, but, but most of the time, 99.99% of the imagery you know, and video that we use to make exhibits and things are taken by people working for the organization as a primary view, so rather than a secondary uh, kind of uh, image resource or uh, you know, image agency, we're not that. We have our first view. It may be secondary to those viewing it, but it's primed from the source, as it were, from, from us. So we, we do stuff for the web. We do actual exhibits. Most of our work is taking the information, the imagery, and doing these kind of thematic and regional exhibits for other institutions as well as our own facilities. We also arrange you know, excursions into these spaces, connecting dots and having local representatives come on board uh, to talk about things. We do field trips uh, with school groups. Uh, we make publications. Um, this is from a series of uh, uh, American Regional Landscape Series. This is about the Hudson River. Uh, we did a, three books now with Blast Books of New York. Uh, but primarily, we understand that most of the audience for what we do is on the internets, and that's where our uh, work really is absorbed. Uh, we are very ground-based, as you can tell, and we have several locations that we've had for years. We also have some that are ephemeral interpretive facilities, but our desert research station near Barstow, uh, is about sort of the backspace of California, a backspace of Los Angeles, and deals with phenomenology about that landscape. Um, a lot of creative projects relating to the way uh, sound or, or, or really electromagnetic waves, in a sense, are sort of manifested, uh, captured, manipulated uh, for detection and for radar and remote sensing. So these are some of the uh, kind of themes that we explore at the Desert Research Station, and we have a walking trail with a number of features. This is a, a kind of a sonic uh, binoculars constructed by an artist named uh, Deborah Stratman. Uh, this is another uh, artist construction, Leroy Stevens 
buried this massive steel sculpture underground uh, out at the Desert Research Station. And the only way to, well, see it, quote unquote, is to detect it using, um, using metal detectors. And people wander around. And, and they're, they're, they have these tone shifts as you sort of approach a piece of the sculpture. And so it sort of manifests itself as this sort of reaction to the detection through sonic uh, um, seeing. Anyhow, uh, at Wendover, Utah, we have uh, on the edge of the Bonneville Salt Flats, uh, several buildings we rent from the county, and it's the old air base uh, for uh, World War II training the, the Colonel Tibbetts' crew, as well as a lot of other uh, activity during World War II. Uh, but it's a remarkable place because it's on the edge of one of the great voids of America, the Bonneville Flats and the Great Salt Lake Desert, uh, part of the Great Basin, doesn't drain anywhere. So it's kind of this isolated zone, Great Salt Lake being a kind of a puddle in the bottom of the basin in some senses, and everything that is drawn to the sort of away space that has evolved there because of the high evaporation and the salinity that builds up in the soil and the fact that it's this terminal landscape of melted mountains and completely flat means that the things, it's hard to live there, it's hard to grow things there, so there isn't much population in the flats, and so the things that like nowhere, quote unquote, uh, are drawn there, such as uh, you know, nuclear waste storage and driving on the ground as fast as you can in no particular direction for no reason at the Bonneville Flats, and, and all kinds of movies looking for the end of the world, and, and uh, uh, all kinds of rocket tests because there's no fear of hitting anything and then Dugway Proving Ground and all on and on and on. So this in a way is the backspace for America, one of them, but it's still one of the great ones, an internal fringe. And for 20 more years, we've had people come out and interpret this landscape through creative residency programs and things. Uh, we even have a Biosphere 3 <laughs> kind of miniature uh, sort of uh, version of a self-contained living working environment on the flats at this sort of terminal kind of landscape. We say, well, what, how, do, how do you begin to construct positive um, living systems in this dead place? Uh, and that's part of the function of this facility built by a group called Simpark. Um, so we have trailers, these office trailers that uh, we use different locations or we rent for doing more focused regional projects. This one's in Houston. Uh, we worked for a few years looking at the, uh, the petrochemical industry of the region, working with the University of Houston. Uh, this is another trailer uh, we had for several years at the edge of Sandia National labs in Albuquerque, and we were focusing on uh, New Mexico as this sort of um, you know, high-tech environment, I guess you could say, um, high-tech landscape of enchantment. Uh, this is a trailer that um, toured around all the different centers of the USA with an exhibit about all the centers of the USA. You know, the geographic center, the geodetic center, the population center, the center of North America, the center of the 48 states, all these different centers, uh, all of which are attempts to try and create a middle ground of the nation, and in a way, a kind of an averaging out of the landscape. And, because it's about centers and we're the center for land use interpretation. We love centers and the idea of centers, no matter how elusive they are, of course, you know, uh, you both know there has to be a center for every giant shape like the USA. But then, of course, how do you actually get to it? And you can't. You, you get to iterations of it, and yet all of them are, are genuine in a sense. And so this trailer traveled to those different centers, bringing them together in a sense, uh, before ending up in Lebanon, Kansas, where we had it as a public display for, for several years, Lebanon being where the 48 states were declared the center before Alaska and Hawaii joined the Union. So it is more of a, I don't know, it feels more like the center than a lot of the other ones, to us at least. And, uh, uh, and it officially was declared the center of the USA uh, by the government, something they regretted doing soon after in the 50s. 
uh, realizing that it really was um, more complicated than that. But it was a good thing for poor old Lebanon, uh, one of these old towns, that agricultural towns that sort of dried up and almost blown away. But anyhow, well, like a lot of our exhibits that we put in these trailers and, and install or in existing buildings, they're accessed with a push button door lock. Uh, and you get the telephone number by looking at the sign on the door. You call the number, you get the phone tree. The phone tree gives you an option for how to get into the building, which in most cases is just one, two, pretty easy, uh, easier than one, two, three. Um, but this is a way in which we're able to you know, keep the kids who are bored and want to trash stuff. You know, nobody's going to call and get permission to go trash something. So they, you know, we were able to actually have a number of these remote exhibit facilities available to the public in these office trailers. And we love office trailers. Uh, we've done whole shows about office trailers. We work with the Getty uh, on this uh, architectural uh, Pacific Standard Time project. They asked us to do something and we, about sort of how the city of LA is growing and these different construction projects, the widening of the freeway and all these kind of expansion of the future city. And we said, well, we'd like to do a project about office trailers in the context of these construction projects. And they said, okay. So we um, made an exhibit about office trailers in an office trailer. Uh, where do they come from? Who uses them? All the different typologies and formations of office trailers. You know, you can use them as classrooms. You can use them you know, to expand your prison space. Uh, you can, so you can spend much of your life in the office trailer. Uh, but also just as sort of these architectural transition zones between the public and the hard hats is where you go put on your hard hat to go behind the office trailer in a sense. There are these kind of uh, interstices between uh, regular space and construction space and building space. Uh, and then we did a series of bus tours going on these uh, sort of, uh, office trailer safaris into Los Angeles, meeting with the engineers who were working on these projects. And you know, the biggest cluster of office trailers in LA, of course, is usually LAX, the big airport. It always has some kind of construction going on. And we met with Mr. Fentress, who was building the International Terminal, a famous architect, and he was kind enough to give a PowerPoint to the group when we went into his office trailer. Um, that's not Mr. Fentress, that's one of his helpers. Um, but most of our work is inside, uh, shown inside our building in Los Angeles, where we do several different types of exhibits a year, uh, which relate to the immediate environment. They're local to LA, because we're there. Uh, so some of them are sort of local regional ones. This one looked at, at how traffic is controlled in the city. We make these posters for most of our exhibits, so that's what we're looking at here, are these, the posters for some regional exhibits. Terminal Island is an island in the port of LA Long Beach, you know, the biggest port in America, one of the biggest in the world, and it's this kind of amoebic looking structure which is kind of gobbling its way towards China and with all the shipping containers coming in from the Orient to supply our consumer needs and then it regurgitates you know, comp you know consumer products that have been compressed you know, uh, and cardboard the shipping container shipping packaging that comes with things which we send back to China though a little less so in recent years uh, uh, once we've sort of used up the new goods so we looked at Terminal Island as in all of its different terminal behaviors uh, that go on there not just international shipping but other stuff LA DWP Power was an exhibit all about electrical infrastructure. Uh, Down to Earth was an exhibit about experimental airplane crash sites. Uh, it was kind of about the history of jet aviation at Edwards Air Force Base, which is the sort of birthplace of you know, the right stuff and uh, the jet age uh, uh, related to the Earth space program and where almost every interesting dramatic jet aircraft development transpired there. And often these things tragically fell to the ground in this realm of experimentation. And this exhibit looked at, uh, we worked with a guy uh, who was the historian for the Dryden Flight Research Center and had access to all these videos and things that had never been seen before that were just riding away in a Quonset hut in Edwards. Um, so, and then we did, of course, a bus tour to go visit uh, crash sites. Uh, this was uh, about parking. Uh, 
parking being what we all want to do with our cars and what cars do for most of their life. Uh, so I mean, we, especially out west, have a very big, deep relationship with vehicles. And uh, so it seems a lot of attention goes to the roads and the uh, you know, design of vehicles and things, but very little attention goes to parking, which is what cars actually do most of the time. So we looked at parking, like why are parking spaces as wide as they are? How are they demarked? Uh, what does a wheel stop look like? Why is it shaped like that? And this, we built a, a parking space in the middle of our exhibit that was a scale version of the one outside the Baja Fresh taco joint down the road. And, uh, and we, so we looked at parking garages, parking, uh, parallel parking, you know, anyways, it was all about parking, very boring, but exciting at the same time. Um, but then we also do exhibits that are regional about other places, besides sort of extrapolating on Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, this one looked at the end of the Mississippi River, where it sort of falls apart into these fractal landscapes that are disappearing because of all kinds of things, mostly human generated. Um, and we even did a show about Massachusetts uh, for the MIT List Center years and years ago, which was about about 100 or so different places depicted and described. And we did a bus tour for that, too. Uh, went out to the Harvard's Observatory, where at that time the SETI program with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence was going on out there with a billion channel assay. Uh, it was a lot, the exhibit and the tour was all a lot about electromagnetic history. <laughs> uh, we went out to Lincoln Labs and Hanscom Air Force Base and, and a number of MIT uh, radio astronomy sites and imaging sites. And, um, and then in another region in the Meadowlands, we focused on for a, 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 a printed tour leaflet, really, a uh, study of the Meadowlands and helping people navigate their way through it and to it. This is a, just a sample image of this amazing landscape outside New York City. You know, New, poor New Yorkers, they don't have any landscapes, they just have architecture. But as soon as they go 10 minutes you know, east, west into New Jersey, this wonderful landscape opens up, the Meadowlands, where all the sinews of urbanness are exposed in the swamps. And, uh, and the Pulaski Skyway you know, flies over it all. So we mapped this space as a kind of an iconic kind of antipode to the clean-ish urbanism and then the sort of more functional spaces that support and enable that urbanism, you know, the Meadowlands where staging and, and logistics and waste disposal and what, medieval times and all the important things. Uh, 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 that are sort of reflected you know, back and forth between the sort of intense urbanness of New York and a place where people often began to think about landscape outside, from New York, you know, including Robert Smithson, who is an artist whose grave is in the foreground there and actually overlooks the Meadowlands uh, and medieval times. The tower is on the right there. Uh, and um, he did a famous tour of the monuments of the Passaic River. This is the Hackensack drainage, but they converge and meet at this wonderful place called Point No Point in Kearney, New Jersey. Anyhow, so this was all about that landscape. And you can, I think, still get our map uh, at one place through our website or, or in the um, New Jersey Turnpike Visitor Centers where we try and keep them stocked have been available for free. Uh, this is another kind of space related to, you know, kind of thematic space, uh, an exhibit we did about the Canadian border with the US. Um, a lot of attention goes to the southern Mexican border, but the Canadian border is uh, longer and full of curiosities than expressive things. Of course, it has no physical size. The line itself is, um, infinitely small, but it creates a line as it goes through space by affecting landscape, trees, architecture, communities. Uh, this is the cut line, as they call it, you know, which is 10 feet on one side is managed by the US and 10 feet on the other side managed by the Canadians. And when it goes through trees and forests, uh, it, uh, it's like some kind of land art derive or something. So we did an exhibit all about it, and we actually got the guy from the Boundary Commission for the US to come give a talk about it. 
and he manages that cut line, that whole space, 5,000 miles, uh, including the Alaska uh, side. So we were focused for the exhibit primarily on, on the 48 state boundary, and we broke it down in these different chapters and uh, you know, started in the east, just like America did, and started with the first thing that the border hits when it hits something, <laughs> comes in out of the ocean and hits this bridge in Maine where literally the international boundary is manifested as different paint uh, and different maintenance schedules uh, on, on, the, uh, on the bridge. Uh, and that line you know, wanders through Maine in all kinds of crazy complex ways and then hits the 45th parallel in Vermont and makes an interesting mess out of Derby, Vermont, where it goes through actual buildings that were intentionally built on it. In North Dakota, there's the International Peace Garden, another wonderful metastasization of the border, where this is the border looking due west, and there's two towers that are sort of divided. This was prior to 9-11, too. It's kind of like 60s kind of celebration of the union of the two countries. And, uh, it's a really uh, dramatic kind of a evocation, almost like a, like a poetic expression of, of in binaries, of reflections, of two things being shared, but also very slightly different. Uh, the park itself is a bubble in the border. You can go there without a, you can be in Canada from the US without your passport or, and vice versa, but then you leave the park you, and if you go in the other country, you need it. But when you're in the park, it, it straddles the border uh, by several hundred acres and you can be in the other country sort of without any problem. And, the, and it divides through all kinds of curious structures in the park, including this organ which was built intentionally on the international boundary. And when you sit there in the organ, this is looking due east. Your left hand's in Canada and your right hand's in the US when you play the organ. Um, yeah. the, so we, that exhibit looked at all that kind of space. Hollowed Earth, well, the underground business parks that are developed inside former, mostly former limestone mines. Um, uh, Subtropolis is maybe the most famous one near Kansas City, and, and there's, there's, you know, lots of space underground that is developed and used in curious ways, and this was an exhibit that looked primarily at the sort of business park redevelopment. Um, a lot of it, especially on the East Coast, is owned by Iron Mountain, um, and this is the original Iron Mountain, incidentally, in, in this location in New York. Uh, on the Hudson River. It was an iron mine for extracting iron for the iron foundries up in Troy, and then it was marketed as a post-nuclear place to put your corporate backup stuff uh, by the mushroom farmer that owned the site in the, in the 50s. And, uh, and I think Standard Oil was one of his first tenants, and it still is uh, used by corporates uh, entities as a backup site. And Iron Mountain has a Boston-based company. Sadly, has has bought up a lot of the underground uh, limestone mines that have been used for record storage. And but mostly, Iron Mountain just shuffles papers around and shreds it and stuff in surface warehouses. But they do maintain a fairly significant collection of underground places, including Boyers, Pennsylvania, which is where the Bettman Archive, which became Corbis, and which is now Getty, with this great image database of the world, is stored underground and processed. Uh, this looked at the 35 or so places across the country which were established over 200 years to anchor the ground to the map uh, west of uh, the original 13 colonies, which are all done by meets and bounds. The rest of the country was done with the Cartesian grid dropped over a place nobody had ever really mapped before, starting in the late 1700s and all the way up until the 1950s in Alaska. Every time you know, we signed a treaty or got land from the natives, uh, however we got it, uh, uh, or got land from Napoleon, uh, the, the federal government would send surveyors out to establish an initial point to lock that entirety into mappable space using that township and range, 36 square mile township and range system, which if you live in the West, you're very aware of. Um, it's how it's why two thirds of the country is north, south, east, west. You know why there's these little 
squares everywhere is because they're locked into this grid. And these were the initial points of those initial federal land surveys uh, that most of which are, have been supplanted by other more recent surveys. But when we've looked around to try and find where the old ones were, uh, we found there were often interesting monumentizations of them for historical purposes. Like this is the one that anchors all of Arizona uh, to the, the grid. And it's looking due east. And you can see how the land patterns are different um, on one side and the other. And we, so it was an exhibit largely about surveying and how surveying works. Uh, this exhibit was about golf uh, across America, <laughs> from Long Island to Pebble Beach. If it were one big golf course, America, it would be almost a mile wide, uh, coast to coast. You could play uh, 500,000 um, holes of golf going across the whole country <laughs> until your ball falls into the Pacific. Um, and we turned the exhibit space into a putting green so people could experience that. Uh, well, it's only one out of five of us that have ever played golf, <laughs> statistically. This was an exhibit about places that, uh, uh, where uranium mining had gone on and then the byproducts were uh, left and then ultimately contained, cleaned up, and then turred under these massively uh, sort of engineered shapes, uh, which range from rectangles to trapezoids of coarse crushed rock and layers of clay that isolate these radioactive tailings mostly uh, from the environment. So they're an attempt to create an architecture that transcends the, you know, mostly, at least individual lifetime. Uh, they really, they probably last a couple hundred years, uh, but they, you know, this is not a forever solution, even though the radioactivity will stay there for some time. But what it does is defer, it kicks the can down the road, I guess is what it does. And there's about 30 or 40 of these in different shapes and sizes around the West, though there's also in Pennsylvania and other places in the Northeast, though in those cases, they mostly put grass on them and maintain them as um, using the, the soil and, and plants to help stabilize it. But out in the West, it's just this granulated, coarse crushed rock creating a kind of carapace uh, and with controlled drainage. So they are kind of like pyramids, you know, in a sense, even though they don't contain the pharaoh legacy of the pharaohs, they contain the legacy of one of the most uh, complicated and, and consumptive uh, in, in uh, engineering projects, the nuclear industry itself. Um, and so it was a kind of a dark show, I guess, uh, looking at these various examples. American Falls looked at urban waterfalls and the, how they created some cities and then were forgotten by the cities and often rediscovered. Uh, they're sort of romantic industrial relics all re-engineered. And, and uh, this exhibit looked at vehicular test tracks in America, which there are dozens. And, they're sort of microcosms of carscapes. This looked at alternative energy, solar uh, plants, the bigger mega scale ones. And starting in 2011, there were incentives that really caused the boom in solar energy plants. Uh, it's uh, created a massive amount of large industrial scale solar across the Southwest. Uh, prior to that, there were really just three solar plants, commercial and solar plants in the US, and they were made in the 80s. Um, this looked at steel production, uh, former steel production sites. This one looked at the internet <laughs> on the ground, a lot of data centers. This looked at cold storage infrastructure, <laughs> the way food moves through this cold chain. A lot of our exhibits are about windowless boxes <laughs> in the suburbs. Uh, but that's kind of what America looks like in a lot of ways. Or that's where the real good stuff goes on. Stuff we depend on. Uh, this looked at uh, the way all the presidents have kind of their legacies are, are formed uh, to record their presidency and where their birthplace, their death place, their, uh, their library, whatever it is. This is one of Lincoln's cabins, I think, uh, but it's in bronze, the ruins of the cabin. 
Uh, this was about the railroad roadscape of, but also it was about scale and magnitude, how the railroad changed the scale of the country. This year is the 150th anniversary of the Golden Spike, the first railroad to cross country. And, uh, the, the, the nation was networked by that event and became kind of industrially cohesive um, landscape. Uh, so this exhibit looked at that, but also the models version of it. So as if the whole country were a railroad layout uh, at a one-to-one -one scale. We looked at the, the small scale, or actually large scale, uh, the uh, iterations of the monuments of this railroad earth, railroad landscape, uh, complicated thing. But anyways, it was an exhibit about large and small railroads. Recently, we did an exhibit about targets uh, in America. Uh, this was a Google Earth show, though we did a lot of groundwork for it too. It was a research project into the 55 or so uh, impact ranges that are scattered around the US, looking at also though at the whole notion of targeting and zeroing in and what targets are like, you know, as these you know, bullseye targets uh, and how scanning the ground at Google Earth looking for bullseyes is kind of like, like a bombardier flying over the landscape looking for the right place to bomb. Um, and they range from Florida to North Carolina. They're, they're not just in the West, they're all over. Um, and you start thinking of sort of Jasper Johns and things as you go through these. Um, they're really quite beautiful. Uh, almost done with this uh, idea of just a very broad overview of where we're coming from. The Ground Our Food Eats was a show about NPK. You know, if anybody who does any gardening understands the three principal elements of fertilizer <laughs> and uh, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. And it turns out that we import most of that stuff, but and a lot of it is produced internally. In fact, the uh, since all the food we eat, like 90, more than 90% of the food Americans eat is done through industrial agriculture that's fed by the fertilization uh, of industrial fertilizers. Uh, in a way, when we eat a vegetable, we're eating the farm product, but we're really kind of eating the nutrients that went into that field that then fed that plant or fed that cow. Uh, so if you follow the food chain, in a way, back to its source, if you source your food, it's not the farm, it's the places where the fertilizer came from. So literally, we're geophagists, you know, eating the earth uh, as we eat food. And this image is one of the more transformed places in Florida, where 75% of the phosphates used in industrial agriculture in America come from just this 40-mile wide stretch outside Tampa, uh, where the Mosaic Corporation has been extracting uh, phosphorus for a long time. Uh, most of the nitrogen, in the, in, that's the N in the NPK, comes from gas plants. This is the biggest nitrogen production plant in Louisiana, um, CF Industries. Um, and this is a, a potash plant now. This, these are the evaporation ponds. They, the mine itself is deep underground, so it's not, not doesn't make a good picture. But when it's brought out from these underground solution mines where they run water through the mine to extract the potash and pump it to the surface and then evaporate it out, they use these dramatic colors to actually pigment the ponds to accelerate the evaporation process. And so that's real color. I mean, we shot this with a with a drone, that's what it looks like. Uh, currently on view, we have this exhibit about helium. <laughs> helium is a thing that, you know, it seems a strange thing to talk about from Lange's point of view because it, it has no substance, really. It's the second lightest gas. It just wants to get out. It just wants to go to space. It wants to get away. It is invisible. It's odorless. Uh, but yet, it is everywhere. It's one of the most prolific elements. It's everywhere except in the atmosphere because it's either in the ground or it's on its way into outer space. Uh, so we capture it to make balloons and blimps and things. We also use a lot of it, most of it these days, to as a coolant for MRI machines and other imaging, because uh, it has a very low boiling point, one of the lowest. Um, 
So we looked at the physical infrastructure of helium, where it comes from and what it, where it goes. And almost all of it for years and years came from Amarillo, Texas, uh, where there's a giant federal helium reserve, which has now been auctioned off to three helium companies. This exhibit was our kind of first foray institutionally into the industrial gas world, which is one that full of surprises. Uh, and this is one of just a handful, really six or eight large helium plants in the US that take process helium from natural gas and turn it into usable helium. Uh, and then we looked at the blimpscape, you know, from the pre-World War II to the World War II period uh, to the current period of blimps being used as surveillance platforms, the tethered aerostats along the US-Mexican border, for example. But that's not what I came to talk about. <laughs> I uh, came to talk about museums. And in a way, I have been. But um, our investigations into land use all across the country, we come across all kinds of museums. And most of them fall into our cultural category of land use. Uh, when we did our executive decisions exhibit, for example, we found out, of course, that just about every president has a museum. And then there's museums for just about all the famous American historical figures out there. Uh, and there's museums for the rest of us, too, when we go. Uh, there's museums of, for cartographic features of the nation. Museums for the fencing that won the West. Museums for the borders that keep us separated. Uh, there's uh, museums about the bounty of our agricultural lands. There's museums for the ingenious farm implements we've devised. Many, many of those kinds of museums. Museums about logging. Museums about just about every kind of food you could imagine, from maple syrup to popcorn, and every kind of meat and potato. <laughs> museums of natural history, which are the progeny of the earliest forms of museums, are, are common. We're in one now, I think. <laughs> but they come in all forms some wilder than others. Though mostly museums across the land are of unnatural history of all sorts that are now, that now abound across the country. Extractive industries have their own museum pantheon, including salt, iron, phosphates, sulfur, dimensional stone, and even ethnic mining. And I imagine you'll find out what that is when you go inside the museum. Uh, the, suitable for a nation that runs on gas, there are dozens of oil museums, starting with this, the first oil well in America, which should and is a truly industrial sacred site. There are several offshore oil museums on oil rigs as well there should be. Renewable energy is represented by at least a dozen windmill museums scattered over the countryside, as well as visitor center-like museums inside things like dams and nuclear energy complexes and other energy facilities. National industriousness is represented in industrial museums across the land, even emer often emerging out of uh, local concentrated forms of industry like this project, which is uh, a big industrial history museum on the grounds of the old steel mill at Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, most of which is now a casino. Another industriousness museum, the Precision Machining Museum, American Precision Museum in Windsor, Vermont, gun museums, lock museums, not too many of those. Uh, 
sanitary plumbing museums. I think this is in, in Worcester. I don't know if anybody's been to it recently. Um, and in the communications and film uh, industries, there's museums of film locations, uh, TV museum. Mm -hmm. I, this is one of few. I think this might even be the only real t museum about TV, the appliances, not TV, the content. Philo Farnsworth Museum in Idaho. Uh, there's telephone museums, which are disappearing, of course. Uh, I don't think there's any cell phone museums that I've come across yet. Uh, Lots of computer museums, and more and more. There used to be very few, really shockingly few, uh, but now there's a few more. Um, cryptology museums are kind of hard to find. <laughs> Electromagnetic museums, and this is right next to the NSA. They're few and far between. There are all kinds of transportation museums, including hundreds of train museums, lots of truck and car museums, and even a few bus museums. There are many ships turned into museums, museums about shipping, and several shipwreck museums, especially in the upper Great Lakes. And there's about, a, well, just under a dozen, I'd say, submarine museums in the US on land. Diving museums, more than you might think. Fortunately, this is a fascinating museum in Sally in Florida, which has Sea Lab and all kinds of stuff. And there are an abundance of air museums covering every part of the land from west to the middle, to the east, and from the regional to the local, from well-supported large-scale aerospace museums to small-scale do-it-yourself aerospace museums. Some of the most interesting museums are next to military bases where they serve as public outreach centers for places that otherwise restrict entry, where products of the military industrial complex are explained or not, where entire histories of submerged technologies are alluded to, if not revealed. And the atomic weapons production complex spanned the nation, as does its museum complex now, including the Bradbury Science Museum, at its origins on the Wizards Mesa at Los Alamos. The National Museum of Nuclear Science and Industry is located in Albuquerque, outside the gates of Sandia National Lab, the nonprofit engineering entity that designed all of our nuclear weapons and still does today. The Atomic Testing Museum is in Las Vegas, 60 miles from the Nevada test site, which is likely the most exploded place on Earth in terms of cumulative megatonnage. Uh, the museum was built by the Department of Energy by the test site contractors, Bechtel and EG&G, &G, on the grounds of the Desert Research Institute. The museum represents some kind of uh, apotheosis of the museum concept, a visitor's center for annihilation, America's ultimate foreign policy, when all else fails, kind of an anti-museum. The Atomic Testing Museum is an affiliate of the Smithsonian, which is, of course, the main museum in America. Though it has affiliates across the land, the Smithsonian itself is mostly clustered in one place on the great national Nidus, the Mall of America, at the national capital where America converges and emanates, like the CLUI itself, the Smithsonian has themes expressed 
by its museums, Ringing the Mall, Natural History, American History, Air and Space, American Indian, Arts and Industries Building, Portrait Gallery, Postal Museum, the Castle, which is what this is, the Historic Administrative Center for the Smithsonian is a kind of meta-museum about the Museum of Museums of America. And beyond its formidable collections, architecture and metrics, the Smithsonian is interesting from a land use point of view because of the primacy of its location on the mall, nestled in with the edifices housing other functions of government and national interest and identity, such as the National Archives, the Library of Congress, the Treasury, Housing and Urban Development, Department of Transportation, Department of Agriculture, the Department of Energy, and all the monuments to dead presidents and war. These features of the mall are indexical nodes representing the categorized forms of activity that take place across the American land, the landscape that we all share and that defines us. Revelation is embedded in the artifacts, large and small, that are fixed in their place on this common ground. All of it open to interpretation and curation by us, by you, by anyone, and where admission is hopefully always free, at least on the outside, even if some of it's not always open to the public. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>